So 9.5 is about dissipative forces. That's generally speaking, that's forces that always oppose the direction of motion. And your two big examples of that are kinetic friction and the force of drag. And if you wanted to have a formula for the magnitude of the kinetic friction, that's equal to the coefficient of kinetic friction times the magnitude of the normal force. And the mat model for the magnitude of the drag is that it's uh, one half times the coefficient of drag times the cross-sectional area. The C is kind of a measure of its boxiness. It, it would be large um, or small if it's a very sort of slippery sort of um, like pellet-like shape. Okay, so one half C, uh, they throw the density of the medium that you're passing through in there, and then it's proportional in this model to V squared. Let's give something else a name up here. We have FK and F drag. We also have at any given moment, we have the velocity of the particle that's experiencing the kinetic friction or the drag. And let's, just so we have a way of doing things for a second here, write that as the magnitude of the velocity times a unit vector in the direction of the velocity. Remember this little caret symbol that we use over the i hat, the j hat, and the k hat? That little caret symbol kind of indicates that this is a unit vector. So there's a nice tidy way of writing the velocity vector. It's the speed times a unit vector pointing in the direction the particle is going. Okay, so with those two things, we can actually write out FK in a nice, nice tiny way. FK is equal to mu KN. Now, that points in the opposite direction of whatever you're dragging the particle in, so that's got a minus V hat in it. Ooh, that's kind of tidy. And F drag is all that mess, okay, the one half C rho V blah, 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 goes right there. And then it's got a minus sign and a V hat times all that junk, okay? And I'm not recopying all that junk because I ran out of room. Let's have the usual situation where you have a box that's being dragged across a plane. So let's have something dragging this box across this plane. Let's make our lives simple. Let's have it be a tension and let's have it be going to the right. And let's make it really simple. Let's make it so that this thing is being dragged with just enough um, tension to exactly counteract the mu sub k mg. The free body diagram for this object like this is the picture, right? And it's like scuffing this surface as it goes across of it. The free body diagram for this object. Okay, and now let's look at the work done on this object. Suppose it moves a distance uh, delta x. And uh, if it moves a distance delta x, that means that the delta r, which is moving to the right, is proportional to i hat and proportional to delta x. And the t, now that we've said that the, the t is pointing straight right, we can say that the, we have a nice little picture of, of what t is. t, because it's pointing to the right, is proportional to i hat, and its magnitude is t. And f sub k, the last vector involved in this problem that's important, is equal to uh, minus mu k mg times i hat. But we said we chose mu k mg to equal to t so that this thing is neither accelerating nor decelerating in the horizontal direction. So this is going to be minus t times i hat for this particular problem. Now I'll tell you, if you go read what Knight has to say in 9.5, he disagrees with me about something here. And maybe I'm badly oversimplifying and Knight is right. Knight says you really shouldn't be in the business of calculating this. And why? Because he says there's a load more going on, and he explains it to you in detail, in more detail than you may want to know at this point in the course. He explains to you in detail what's happening 
that's creating this force of friction. He talks about the molecular bonds that are briefly formed and destroyed between the bottom of the box and the surface of the table. So there's, as the box moves across the table, the molecules are actually touching. They grab onto each other and basically they tear at each other. And so the other thing that's going on here is that, that this frictional force, which is pulling to the left as far as the box is concerned, is actually doing a lot more than that. It's uh, damaging and heating up the molecules in the surface of the plane, and it's damaging and heating up the molecules in the surface of the bottom of the box. And so Knight says this situation is actually so much more complicated than just the kinetic friction is doing so much some work on the box that he would prefer not to calculate it. And so he, he sticks with just calculating, say, the work done by the tension in this situation. And uh, although he talks about how much work is done by dissipative forces, he doesn't uh, like to directly calculate it. Now I want to calculate one more thing for you um, having to do with the work done by the kinetic friction. So we'd like to know the work done by the kinetic friction, even though Knight shies away from calculating this. The kinetic friction is equal to, now I also have a nice expression for the motion of the particle. If I, if I wait a little time delta t during which the particle has velocity vector v, the amount of distance traversed in each of the components is v delta t. Now this is a vector equation. It actually tells you three equations. It tells you that delta x is bx delta t, delta y is by delta t, and delta z is vz delta t. It tells you those three of those equations in a very nice compact form. And now using that up there, we can rewrite this again. This is v times v hat times delta t. Okay, and now we're in a great position to calculate the work done by the kinetic friction in a time delta t. You take this and you dot it into that, meaning that you take minus mu k n v hat and you dot it into v v hat delta t. So the work done by the kinetic friction in a time delta t is that dotted into that. Now let's get copy all the constants out front. We got the minus, the v, we've got the delta t, we've got the mu k, and we got the n, the magnitude of the normal force. Those are all the constants. And then the vectors we have to deal with is v hat dot v hat. But v hat dot v hat is yet another easy case. If you have two vectors that are the same length, it doesn't matter what direction they point in, so here's two vectors, same length, actually both of them have length one, they both point in the same direction. So let's say the velocity was shooting off that way, and then a unit vector in that direction is that. Well, this says dot that unit vector into another unit vector that's pointing in that direction. And so that would be the length of the first unit vector, which is one, times the length of the second unit vector, which is one, times the cosine of the angle between them, which is the cosine of zero degrees. So all this goop here is one. Well, that's kind of a nice expression. We now have the work done by the kinetic friction in a little tiny time, delta t, is equal to minus mu k n v delta t. And by the way, you would have had that the work done by the tension in that same time was equal to t v delta t. Now there's something cool we can do with these two formulas. And that's the subject of night section 9.6. Let's just focus on one of these. It doesn't matter which one we do. Let's focus on this. The work done by the tension force is the tension times the amount that you moved, which in this case was V delta T. Of course, if your speed's changing or the tension's changing, this is only going to be true if you take the limit that delta T goes to zero and you look, say, hey, oh, the tiny amount of work done in that tiny amount of time was whatever the tension was at that time times the whatever the speed was at that time. And so in that case, 
Rather than calling this the work done by the tension force, we should call it the little bit of work done by the tension force in the little bit of time delta t. Now we can divide this equation through by delta t, and then we have delta w, the little bit of work done by the tension in the little bit of time delta t, is equal to tv. The next thing we can do is we can take the limit that delta t goes to zero so that this equation is exact. And if this box wasn't just moving in the x direction, um, then this would be uh, t dot v. But uh, in a situ nice simple situation we were dealing with, instead of it uh, being t dot v, the tension dotted into the velocity, it nice simple situation where we were dealing with where the tension force was pointed to the right and the velocity was pointed to the right, it's just t times v. Okay, now this thing here has a name. The amount of work done in a little bit of time, if you take that ratio, we call that the power. So now we have a formula for the power. And that's kind of cool. Uh, the power is the rate at which work or energy is transferred into a system. That's the power. And of course, it can be transferred out of the system if you're trying to extract power from a system. Now let's talk about units. In the MKS system, the units are the meter, the second, and the kilogram. That's why it's called the MKS system. If you look at position, we usually measure that in meters. If you look at speed or the components of velocity, we measure that in meters per second. If we look at acceleration, that's measured in meters per second squared. The next thing that came along in the course was because we had F equals MA so much, and this M here, by the way, has absolutely nothing to do with that M there. This M here stands for mass. That M there stands for meters. Now, anyway, we had F equals MA so often in the course that A, which has dimension acceleration, was multiplied by M, which has dimensions of kilograms. So this was coming up a lot. And that came up so often, we called that the Newton. And then the next thing that came along was we said work. And work was force times distance, roughly speaking. If we had a little bit of work done in some time period where a particle moved a, a distance delta r, we asked what the force done by that work was in that time. It was f dot delta r. Well, since this has dimensions of newtons and this has dimensions of meters, we have the need for a new unit, which was the newton meter, which is the unit of work. And that one comes up enough that it got the name Joule. Now we have the need for another, because now we have the amount of work done in an amount of time, delta t. So we have something in the numerator which has dimensions of joules, and the denominator which has something in dimensions of time, and this is the power. So that's joules per second. So we have a new thing, joules per second. And that one comes up so much, it would be nice to have a name for it. And the name for it is the Watt. And we abbreviate that capital W. Which is annoying, of course, because capital W is also what we're using for work. So be careful, the unit of, of, of power uses the same symbol as the variable we usually use for work. So now we have three important units in the MKS system, which are also known as derived units because they are derived from the original fundamental units of the MKS system. If you've already chosen your unit of length, your unit of time, and your unit of mass, then these units just follow from those. I hope you have all you need to know everything about chapters 1 through 9 now. And the next thing we'll start, which is not on the midterm, is chapter 10.